Great. All right. Why don't we get started? Renee, take it away. Thank you. So I just want to thank everyone first for, for coming today. We know you all have really busy schedules. So thank you so much for taking time out. To give you a little bit of context as to why we're having this working group, a lot of you did attend our Genomic Medicine 14 uh, meeting that was held a couple months ago. And two of the items that came out of that meeting was the need to create a consult service or expert panel to help educate clinicians about genetic test orders, interpreting and determining next steps. And by clinicians, we're really talking about those non-genetic trained providers. And then second to that was to develop a learning community of practice, a listserv, or something to provide information and updates, um, you know, potentially supplemented by a panel of experts. So that's really what today's workshop is about, is how we could actually develop those. Um, so today, what we really do want to do is examine the infrastructure and the logistical needs to identify barriers and solutions to putting that together. And then to also talk a little bit about outcome measures. How could we measure um, what it is we're putting together? So that's our big overarching goal for today. Um, Terry, did you want to add anything to that? Um, no, thanks, Renee. That, that covers it, except I might just mention um, one of the things we were urged to consider at the, uh, the 14th meeting that uh, Renee alluded to was to uh, ensure that we promote equity of implementation in low resource and underserved settings. So that's always a challenge, uh, one that we want to be sure to address. Absolutely. So the way we wanted to start was just if we could introduce each other and then we'll move really into our discussion. But um, first, let's start with introductions and we just want a brief introduction, your name and which institution you're at. So if we could start with Adam. Hi, Adam Buchanan, uh, Chair of the Department of Genomic Health at Geisinger. Next, Rizwan. Uh Rizan Hamid, uh, Professor of Pediatrics, Clinical and Biochemical Geneticist at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Leland? I am Leland Hall. I'm a general internist at Mass General Hospital. Muin? And I know I said Hi, <clears throat> the, uh, I'm Muin Khoury from the uh, CDC Office of Genomics and Precision Public Health. Melinda? Hi, I'm Melinda Massard. I'm a family medicine physician and I run a primary care precision medicine clinic here at UPMC in Pitt. Howard? Hi, Howard McLeod. I'm medical director for the Geriatric Oncology Consortium and an executive clinical director for precision health for the Intermountain Healthcare System. Carolyn. Hi, I'm Carolyn Menendez. I'm the director of the very new program at the VA through the National Oncology Program uh, called Clinical Cancer Genetic Service. Dan? Hi, I'm Dan Rader at University of Pennsylvania, where I'm chair of the Department of Genetics and chief of uh, clinical genetics uh, divisions in medicine and pediatrics. <clears throat> Nathaniel? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, Nat Robin. Uh, I'm the uh, uh, director of uh, medical genetics at University of Alabama, Birmingham. Todd? And uh, everybody, uh, Todd Scorp from here at Indiana University, professor of medicine and the director of the Indiana Institute for Personalized Medicine. Jason? I am a general internist. I practice at the Boston VA, um, but I'm also involved in genomic medicine activities at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And then Terry? Uh, great. I'm also a general internist, Terry Manolio. I lead the division of genomic medicine. And you, Renee? And I'm Renee Ryder. I'm a new program director at NHGRI, and I am a genetic counselor. Okay, so um, the the first session that we wanted to start on was infrastructure, and Terry's going to moderate that. Great, thanks. Um, and what I'd suggest we do, uh, we, we have six items that we, we want to pick your brains about. And what I thought we would do is, you know, we've got about 50 minutes, so maybe spend six or seven minutes on, on each of these. And, and um, what I, I'd like to do is kind of go around the virtual room alphabetically and, and just ask, you know, three or four people um, for their, their input on, on a given one, and, and then we can have some discussion. Uh, so Adam, that's, you know, forewarning you that you're 
you that you're up first for types of expertise. Um, so keeping in mind what we're what we're looking at here is setting up and studying because we are a research institute, um, a, a nationwide genomic medicine service. So so not traditional genetics, but really the, the more the broader um, uh, genomics results and, and input. Um, so setting up consultation service to deal with those kinds of things. So Adam, what thoughts do you have on the types of expertise that that might need? Well, in addition to the genetics expertise itself, uh, I think a couple other types. So we've gotten a lot of input from our primary care clinician colleagues uh, on implementation in the routine care. So the routinization of that information, that's critical here because that touches the uh, breadth of patients uh, over the longitudinal care that you'd need to provide. Um, the other is some implementation uh, science expertise as well. You know, so many of our attempts in genetics to try to educate our non-genetics colleagues have failed because they haven't fit. And so they, you know, we haven't uh, brought the right sort of expertise to understanding what does fit into the flow of care and implementation provides some of those tools. Super. Oh, thank you. Uh, Rizwan, do you have thoughts on additional expertise? Um, so uh, when you say, Terry, explain what you, when you say additional expertise, what does that mean? Um, well, so Adam has identified that we would need genetics expertise in a in in a consult if we were to set up a nationwide consult service. Um, primary care uh, physicians are very interested in implementation, so we'd probably need some implementation science expertise. Uh, in addition to a geneticist, you know, yeah. presumably there are other yeah. things. Yeah. So I think uh, I would say an informatistician or informatics person would be, I think, important because. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, somebody with knowledge, um, with, with somebody who can deal with databases and has some degree of programming knowledge, because I guess the way we think about the, the way I think about this is it'll require some, some aspects of it will require some sort of automation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it'll be important because we as clinicians and as, you know, research scientists, we can come up with a lot of ideas. Uh, which may sound great on paper, but may not be imp uh, implementable within a cost structure or within a time frame. So I think those are, um, in addition to obviously the, you know, you need clinical geneticists and you need um, uh, folks with genomic inf knowledge, whether they're PhD folks and genetic counselors, et cetera, et cetera. But I think those, those three four types of people uh, People with data who can who have clues about I mean not clues but who uh -huh. have expertise in database management uh, people who are informatic specialists uh -huh. uh, I think Great. are going to be important. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Leland, so, so Ruswan um, alluded to perhaps genetic counselors as, as well. That hasn't come up yet. What do you what do you think? I mean, I think from the perspective of translating um, both to uh, generalist clinicians as well as to patients, you would, that's where kind of general genetic counselors would be uh -huh. invaluable. Um, I think that, you know, at least at our hospital, um, in terms of kind of questions that we get, um, the primary care sends in for a service like this, it's overwhelmingly cancer genetics, OBG genetics. And then I would say that beyond just thinking about what specialties you need, you might need to think about, um, just more the triage within uh, even um, spe specialty fields to the specific person who handles that specific concern, because that is a huge navigation issue within like cardiology, <laughs> who does arrhythmias, who does et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, even when you have the specialty, um, who is the specialist? No, that's a great point, Leland. So, Leland. Um, so, so when it comes to the triage, is is that I, I know in, in some of your services, as they were described in the in the meeting materials, uh, some have a genetic counselor do that, some have other people. Do you have thoughts as to who would be a good triage person? Yeah. So we um, uh, we've started a pooled um, e consult service where we've actually had a genetic counseling assistant who works under um, a genetic counselor who kind of is. Um, under many of you know Heidi Rehm, of course, who um, and her like genomics group. So they have kind of a footprint across a lot of different um, specialties that offer specialized genetics care. And so the genetic counseling assistant, many times because they're scheduling in those clinics, can 
um, will know kind of this is the person, but if not, could go to kind of a supervising genetic counselor um, in order to kind of direct to like within that subspecialty, this is the subspecialist uh -huh. for that concern. Super. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Moeen, do you have additional types of expertise we should consider? I think I may have a lot, but... Uh... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm lacking the context because I wasn't at the uh, <clears throat> genomic medicine meeting and may, may not have read the recommendations. So, if, uh, you know, just looking at the materials for today, kind of at uh, a little bit of a loss because you say, you know, we want to do this, but it's not traditional genetic services, it's genomic medicine. Mm -hmm. I need a little bit more before I can offer my opinion. Maybe, I mean, not a whole lecture, but just a two minute no, intro. Fine. Yeah, and I think I think Renee described it well, and I should have I should have reiterated that we're really talking about non-geneticist, pr probably primary care or non-geneticist physicians, as well as nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, et cetera. So so when they get a result back, or when they see somebody that they think might need genetic testing, you know, um, what what kind of expertise do we want to send them to? And I think we heard about some some subspecialties, cardiology and oncology would be would be fairly obvious. I think that we'd want to have people who have genetics expertise within those subspecialties. Are there are there other subspecialties you can think of, Moy? Actually, can I jump in real fast Please. and just also say that you know, I think what we're also trying to do is differentiate this from a traditional referral service mm -hmm. that a lot of places are having a hard time getting, maybe they don't have a geneticist in their, in their facility, so they don't have someone to refer to. So what we're really, what we've been asked to do is to examine the creation of a consult service. So instead of sending your patient to see the geneticist, the consult service would let you figure out as a primary care physician, how to take care of your patient. So maybe yeah. we'll let you we'll let you think on no, that, Muin. I'll let you take on this. Okay. okay. All right, please. Uh, Dan, I noticed you nodding. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I have a few few things to add. I, I think uh, it goes without saying. I think we definitely need LC expertise here to 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 be part of this. Um, I would uh, suggest that you know, s some element of you know expertise in in health disparities, social determinants of health. I think uh, you comment on that, Terry. I, I think we really need some real input into that. Mm -hmm. I, another would be um, some of these are going to be research results that come back to, you know, the patient and then the physician and and the physician's like, I don't know what to do with this. So, so someone who has some real actual expertise in return of research results might be something to think about. Um, um, that's a whole discipline unto itself, of course. Mm -hmm. um, behavioral economics is a field that is very big at Penn, and um, maybe I've drunk the Kool-Aid, but I think uh, you know, it's a big field that has to do with incentivization, not just monetary, but how to get people to do the right thing, you know, especially uh, caregivers. And so expertise in behavioral economics, I think, might be um, something to think about. And then um, Adam didn't mention it, but pharmacogenetics, it seems like oh. this pharmacogenetics could be a component of this service. In fact, I think increasingly it might be. So that would be another area to, to think about. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. We, we need to move on to the next issue, but was there anything else that anyone wanted to add? Uh, in Yes, Carolyn. I just, I just wanted to reinforce the statement about is someone with expertise in cancer genetics. Ah. So I think, I think having an oncologist, I'm a surgical oncologist, a breast surgeon in my program. And I, I think it does add an important layer to a service like this. Great. No, good point. And Curtis. Melinda, you raised your hand as well. Yeah, I I, um, I want to echo the, the behavioral change um, need, right? Because primary care is so busy um, and really getting them to um, take on any education around how to integrate this is a huge struggle and challenge um, and very overwhelming. So really thinking about how to drive that behavioral change. Mm -hmm. And then two, I really think we need to think about the payers as well and how we can actually simplify and streamline testing um, as testing is so complex and nuanced. Um, we know that it's actually overwhelming right now in its current form. And if we can advance payer support of mm -hmm. streamlining testing, and that will really go far in terms of creating orderables that are much more clear to non-geneticists. Great. No, thank you. And I see we have two hands up. Moeen, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to hold your question because we do need to move on. But Todd and Jason were in already. So Todd, go ahead briefly. Yeah. I mean, um, like Melinda, uh, or Melinda said, the biggest thing that drives genetic testing for us is reimbursement, uh, basically. So somebody who understands that, how to appeal, how to, uh, to do that, 
The second biggest concern that usually comes up is legal. It's like, well, if I do this, am I li what am I liable for? If I'm the ordering doctor and I put this in the records, do I think uh, legal is a, you know, some sort of legal advice on that is critical. And then a pharmacist, because it's and not only for the pharmacogenetic, but also for the other stuff, because what drugs they're on, what drugs they're considering plays into the, you know, the genetic interpretation too. Excellent point. Thanks. Uh, Jason, last comment. Yeah, and I would just play off Melinda and Todd's comments. So yeah, we should work with payers to improve the situation, but with the expertise we would need if we were going to stand this up now is someone who can navigate the current insurance system as it is. So when <laughs> someone calls up and they're uninsured, they'll get different advice and and about what kind of services they can get than if they have Medicare or if they've got VA insurance. So someone who knows how to navigate the current system, which is going to be tough on the national on the national level. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. So, so Moeen, since I, I sort of surprised you with the, the last one, would you like to uh, to comment on the target audience uh, for these kinds of? Uh, no, I mean, th this is such an important <clears throat> work. I mean, I, th I think the target audience would be the primary care, the um, physicians at large who, uh, I mean, who are not geneticists, who see patients either for prevention or, you know, regular care. But if I can get to that first one also, because I'm, I'm thinking about that package it looks like a sort of a multi-level implementation science, mm -hmm. putting all, all the pieces together, all the disciplines. And is this going to be at the end some kind of a massive national research study to evaluate the components? Maybe we can put that in the parking lot because, of course, I mean, we, you need the ethical, the legal, the navigation of all of these. But, you know, in a uh, in low resource settings, I mean, or whatever, I mean, people want to, uh, to consult. I mean, it's looking like you're describing a massive effort. And maybe I'll ask the other panelists whether all the components are needed and for what purpose. So just, just put it out there. Yeah, I think, um, Moeen, if you don't mind, um, we'll, don't mind. Yeah, we'll, we'll kind of maybe focus on, on the, the things that we've addressed. I think that will come up in the other topics that are raised. But let's, as you say, put it in the parking lot. Uh, we're not thinking of something massive here. Uh, we are thinking of something practical and useful, but we also need to do uh, some research around that. So um, maybe if, uh, if I could then go to uh, Melinda, would you like to comment on the target audience? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm the target audience. <laughs> I, um, I, I am a family medicine genomics practitioner mm -hmm. and, um, and would love to see all of you know, my colleagues become the same. Um, many of you have heard me say before, but I truly believe that primary care practice is about 70% of every subspecialty. And there's no reason that genetics and genomics could not be one of those. Um, if we could start integrating it into the education system from the get-go all the way through residency training and then ongoing CME for, for, for actual real-life uh, implementation. But I think it's everywhere from the physician to the, um, you know, to the mid-levels, the, the APPs who are working heavily in the primary care space, um, to pharmacists who are working heavily uh, to support primary care providers. Um, and so I, I think that really is the target audience, although I will also say I think there are many specialist providers out there who are adopting genomics into their diagnostics, and they too need to become non-genomics practitioners okay. uh, or non-genetics practitioners of genomics and precision medicine. So the audience is quite large. Great. Thank you. And what are APPs? Sorry. Oh, sorry, advanced practice practitioners. So PAs and nurse practitioners. Oh, I've never heard that. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Howard, do you have thoughts on uh, on audience in addition to what we've heard? Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest need is is at the clinical edge. Um, and I would I would argue that they don't want to learn about genetics. They just want to know what to do. Um, and so I think the, the audience uh, that needs this the most are, are the folks that um, have 30 seconds to um, pick on something and then apply it. So um, it's, uh, it's a rapid fire audience of, of all the people we've all, that we've already talked about, including the maternal fetal medicine folks, which we haven't really been brought up as, as clearly um, now, because they, they are also a kind of a real time um, uh, environment uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to setting up an appointment for three months from now. Mm -hmm. 
Great point. Yeah, and I think that, that also the need in, in medical subspecialties, probably pediatric subspecialties as well, because not every cardiologist knows what to do with sudden death or, or other things. So uh, maybe last person on this on this issue, Carolyn, do you want to make any more additions? I think it's very important to bring in the APPs as our target audience, because that that really when we think about cancer genetics, we think about the survivorship clinics, um, we think about onco primary. Um, so really, I think with a large initial focus being PA and nurse practitioner programs, um, getting this education and and going backwards just a little bit, it kind of made me chuckle that I left out um, marketing people because I'm, I'm, I'm in the midst of rolling something out on this scale, doing this national VA project, and you come up with these beautiful plans, and then you say, how are we going to tell everybody what we just built? Great point. Yeah, yeah, because that is, a, you know, a real challenge, I think, how we're going to do that. So are there other comments now on target audience, or do we have it pretty much covered? See, Dan, you asked a question about assuming patients would not ac access this directly, but rather through clinicians. I think that's what was recommended. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, I, I, I shudder to think the kind of service we'd be able to, <laughs> to get there if, if patients could access it. So, all right. Why don't we move back, um, uh, move on then to to the type of user feedback we we might want to get. Keep in mind that the the Genomic Medicine 14 meeting was on genomic learning healthcare systems that have that virtuous cycle of of implementation, evaluation, uh, modification, and then re-implementation. So so assuming we won't get it exactly right the first time, um, Dan, could you comment on on what kind of uh, um, um, sorry, it's not Dan, it's Nat. Sorry, Dan. Um, could, could you, no, I guess it is Dan, my apologies. Um, could you comment on, on what kind of uh, feedback we might like to get from the users of this? Um, well, it, that, that brings up another form of expertise, which is expertise in qualitative research. So clearly we're going to want, um, uh, re, you know, reported surveys from the, from the users of this in terms of what their experience was in, in a formalized qualitative research kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, um, obviously there are a lot of metrics that, that would be generated um, that would be useful. Um, it, it would be nice to have some sort of quote outcomes, meaning what, what actually happened. Um, um, that's going to be harder to collect and a lot more expensive. Um, I'm just talking off the top of my head. Those are a few of my thoughts. <laughs> Great. No, thank you. And and we do have, actually, we have um, some time specifically set aside to, to talk about outcomes. So uh, agreed. Um, in, in terms of the making the system better, I think that's what we're, we're looking for on the feedback. So, so thanks. Um, Nat, did you have some thoughts on the, on feedback? Yeah, um, I agree we need to have some feedback and but there's if you if you want to guarantee people not using this, give them a big survey to fill out <laughs> as soon as they use it. So to me, in my experience with this, the biggest thing people want is timeliness. So they want to make sure their questions are handled in a timely manner and completely. Um, so you could kind of do biopsies where you survey maybe every 10 interactions. And I think surveying the um, patients is equally important um, to make sure their questions are answered. Um, but if I could circle back one second, sure. you know, I, I, I read what everyone's doing. I read what we're doing. You know, the plan I sent in is only like a preliminary plan. We've really gone back and forth on this over the last couple of years. We're trying to figure it out. And what's clear to me is the danger of doing something at a national level is that one size doesn't fit all because the needs of Boston are very different than the needs of Birmingham and the state of Alabama. Um, so I just want to point that out that while we have some really good ideas here and smart people thinking about that, th th there, there are different things. So, you know, we're going to be servicing, if, if we do something like this, we'll be literally servicing chunks of four states, you know, um, wow. and we're going to be servicing people who may not have internet access. Um, so I, I think that's something that needs to be remembered, especially when you talk about equity. Um, you know, the folks, were, if we're going to deal with a cancer surgeon in Selma, Alabama, that's very different than dealing with somebody in Brookline for, you know, if you're downtown Boston. Um, no, that's an I don't mean financially necessarily, I just mean for you know, access wise. Right. And any thoughts on how we can make this accessible to, to Selma as, as well as to Brookline? Yeah, I, I, I think they need us. 
Yeah, uh, a lot of things, but I don't think, you know, that that's the, I don't, you know, what, again, what we're doing here doesn't necessarily make sense. I mean, one of the things our hospital is doing is we're buying up most of the smaller hospitals in the, in the region and we're creating networks. So there has to be some kind of infrastructure, <laughs> either with a shared EMR or an accessible EMR. And there has to be, I forgot who mentioned it, but a, a, a very widely publicized service. And that's even within UAB, we're trying to do that, is get people to understand what is the economic benefit. Dan mentioned the, the whole thing about behavioral economics. We've tried that amazingly unsuccessfully. Um, but we've tried to show people this will save money. And the only time we've ever gotten any headway is when we've shown the hospital, you're losing X amount of dollars because people don't know what they're doing around genetics. People are not happy. They're not getting the proper pre and post test counseling. One other thing to point out real quick is, um, I don't know how many states have lost track have counseling uh, licensure for genetic counselors. Those states have pretty strict restrictions on who can provide pre and post test counseling. It's within the state. You can't have a primary care provider do it. That violates state genetic counseling laws in many states. It does in Alabama, for example. So th there, there are all these other issues that I think are state-based and will be difficult. I don't want to say impossible to overcome, but and this may be one of those things where there is, you know, I don't think, let me say it differently. I would bet there is not one solution that will fit 50 states Mm -hmm. not even, you know, eight regions of the country. This may be something that has to be done initially, if not as state by state level, just at a couple state level. Mm -hmm. no, that's an excellent point. Uh, Moeen, you had, had a comment? Yeah, yeah. I want to want to continue that uh, train of thought about uh, state versus national. You know, one of the, uh, I mean, there are 50 states, obviously, each has their own uh, flavor of health and healthcare and uh, delivery of services, whether they're genetics or otherwise. And I think it, it behooves NHGRI from the beginning to do that state partnership uh, through the organizations that uh, speak for states, like the Association for State and Territorial Health Officials. The health officer of each state is kind of in charge of the health of the state. If you can get the buy-in of the state health official, then they can work with the state and local and try to do the, you know, the equity. I mean, rural areas in Alabama are different than rural areas in, in Nevada. So I think developing the one size approach at the national level will probably be um, uh, succeed if you, you do that uh, state by state sort of public health approach. Along the same lines, I mean, you know, HRSA is, uh, <clears throat> you know, does genetic services, as you know, and uh, they're reinventing their enterprise. I mean, they're, um, their um, traditional, um, you know, the, the regional networks, uh, mm -hmm. which are only focused on maternal child health issues. Uh, they came down and visited CDC not too long ago, uh, about two weeks ago, actually, I had a, a chat mm -hmm. with the new division director, and they're, they're, thinking, they're thinking outside the box a little bit. So mm -hmm. genomic medicine is not genetic services, as you mm -hmm. point out, but uh, that kind of uh, partnership with CDC, HRSA, and then through the states and the regions could be beneficial for mm -hmm. such an enterprise and could complicate it a little bit, but um, I, I think long, longer term success will be more assured. Mm -hmm. Great. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, um, Todd, we may sh shift over to the equitable access, which has, has come up already, but if you had additional thoughts on, on access. So I think it's... Um... We need to remember this is a different uh, equitable access than trying to contact patients out in uh, rural areas and, and do that, right? So we're really talking about the primary care uh, docs uh, or pharmacists or nurses uh, out in there. So I think the issues, some of the issues we uh, face with, uh, you know, patients not having smartphones or having pay, you know, time things, I don't think are issues. I think as long as it's, you know, either... Um, you know, even phone or Zoom or, uh, you know, online um, chats or, you know, some sort of thing like that. I don't think, I mean, it seems like that would, and, and there's not a big cost to it and uh, it's fast, uh, right? So you don't have to wait uh, three weeks. It, you know, almost, it probably isn't going to be instantaneously, but, um, you know, the amount of time it takes them to do it and the turnaround time, as long as those things are met, uh, I don't know that. Um, I mean, I think those would be key things to make sure that, you know, uh, somebody out in the rural Indiana would be able to use it. 
Super. Now, excellent points about the difference between reaching out to patients versus reaching out to, to providers. Um, and I think we're, to, we're focusing really on the providers here. So, um, Jason? Well, if, I, if I could jump in real quick. Please. Because I think that there's an important point here. Again, my experience, different than other people's experience, but the majority of providers outside of the academic medical center have, they just want somebody to say, here, help me order this genetic test tell me and then help me counsel them because they're not equipped to do pre or post test counseling. Right. So while I agree, we're talking about reaching out to providers and I think we can't forget that in many instances, part of this will be reaching out to patients as well. Good point. Good. Um, Jason, did you have uh, additional thoughts on equitable access? Um, no, <laughs> well, I'll talk anyway, even if I don't. Um, <laughs> the, um, so, I guess by the fact, you know, by the premise that the, we're already talking about patients who have some amount of access, right? They've made it to a clinician. The clinician now has a question about whether there's a role for genomic medicine in their healthcare. So already, already we're, the, the, the patient has already passed that first hurdle, which is a big one to access medical care. Um, and now they're at the point where a clinician can actually think, formulate the question. I still think that the question then when this, when this, provider is then calling up this service or accessing this service, a lot of the, a lot of the um, impact on whether the patient has equitable access will be how knowledgeable the, this expert consultant on the phone is, this hotline is, about how to get that particular patient with, in their particular social circumstances connected to the right test. Um, and if they're uninsured, what is the answer to that question? Um, and so, I, th I still come back to kind of being able to navigate the, the like the real world where the rubber meets the road. Wh what lab do we send this patient to? Um, mm -hmm. Kind of kind of questions, and who's going to pay for that? Mm -hmm. And and someone at the national level who can know the answers to that is going to require someone who's very resourceful. Um, genetic counselors actually, as a profession, are very resourceful, so they actually might be very well positioned to answer those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to take that kind of expertise. Great, no, excellent point, thank you. Uh, Leland? I mean, I think that, you know, I was originally envisioning that this is a centralized service, right? But I think really more and more, you know, what we might be thinking about is genetic counselor navigators who can, you know, go to a clinic or have a region that they rotate through to provide kind of on the ground care who are your patients who you're concerned about? Maybe those patients have been on the back burner for a while because you don't know how to navigate for them or they have, and then also you avoid maybe some of the, you know, on an equity standpoint, if somebody writes in the chart, well, get six month breast MRIs and those aren't covered for that patient from an e-consult and you're like, well, I can't follow through on that recommendation, mm -hmm. then who's on the hook for that, you know? Um, from the provider standpoint. So maybe having that conversation kind of upfront rather than all electronically. Mm -hmm. No, excellent point. Uh, Adam? In thinking about where to uh, target both development and evaluation, we can also think about some underserved communities and specifically federally qualified health centers and looking to get down into those places and make sure that we're hearing what the key issues are there. That gets us a little bit closer to Jason's point about actually getting to the patients who may not have those regular interactions with uh, with the health system. So uh, I think we want to be really deliberate about mm -hmm. where to focus the development efforts and then where to think about the evaluation piece as well. Mm -hmm. Super. No, thank you. Um, so maybe we can move on then to, to something that has come up a little bit uh, in terms of licensing and, and liability. Uh, I don't know, Adam, if you want to, to pick up on that topic. So... There are certainly cross state line licensure issues in well all of medicine really and, and it's when you talk about genetic counseling it is complicated by the variability in which states have licensure and which don't and what the uh, rules are and under each uh, state's medical board. Um, that said, there are groups that have solved for that pretty well, including some of the telehealth companies, and uh, so you know they solve it by having individuals who have. Uh, They've got kind of a combination of a licensure that ends up covering the, the country. So taking a similar approach with a consult service could help to solve some of that. 
Great point. Thank you. Um, and I think after Adam, we have uh, Rizwan. Go ahead. So, uh, so I think I will uh, go back to what Nat was saying earlier. I think, and that actually brings in the, the licensure issue. I think the solution to this, while well, NHGRI sets a overall guide, uh, guiding principles uh, and provides support, the solution to this would be at a state level uh, mm -hmm. or regional level, because um, it is just impossible for a central organization to know what the insurance rules are. At a state level, for example, at Vanderbilt, I can provide counseling to folks in Kentucky, you know, Carolinas, mm -hmm. Georgia, because we get to see patients from there. And so, so I think the solution to this is has to be uh, has to be driven by state or regional levels. I think one thing I would just point out is that you know, talking about diversity and equity, um, part of what we encounter um, uh, encounter is that um, that some populations in states are reluctant to interact with big medical centers, right? So, I mean, the many times policies are driven by big, you know, medical centers like Vanderbilt and, and stuff. So one way to kind of bypass that issue is uh, look at how the state newborn screening program was set up, right? We don't, for example, we at Vanderbilt provide newborn counseling uh, or advice about, hey, this test is, what do I need to do, right? So there's a framework set up and we actually have people reaching out to us from community hospitals, individual pediatrician, family practitioners, nurse practitioner, because they feel comfortable with the way the system is set up mm -hmm. at a state level. It's not like a Vanderbilt, it's like a state of Tennessee newborn screening program, which is set by the genetic advisory committee. Mm -hmm. So I've always wondered if we were gonna do that, whether that's the way to do that. Maybe this, there's a state genomics advisory committee mm -hmm. which sets up the system and empowers the, let's say the, in, in Tennessee, there are three major uh, uh, medical centers who provide the newborn screening coverage, mm -hmm. something similar to that. So then you are, for example, at, at Vanderbilt, I am I'm in responsible for Middle Tennessee. I know all the insurance rules there. I can actually tell the physician mm -hmm. what to do, what will be covered. I know my own state Medicaid, Medicare rules. Uh, so I think that is- Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Rizwan, sorry to interrupt you. I just, I wanna be sure to give others a, a chance as well. And, and Moeen, you've had your hand up for a bit. Yeah, I just want to continue that discussion because it, it looks like we're, we, I mean, I want to continue down that state uh, mm -hmm. state rabbit hole. Uh, there is a way, if we take newborn screening as an example, where state and national have interacted successfully. I mean, newborn screening panels were, you know, uh, sort of the wild west for many, many years until the advisory committee came in, set some standards, have the uh, recommended univer uh, universal screening panel, and it got things organized. The implementation of genomics in practice may require something like this. It's not a, a state-run program like newborn screening where all the blood spots go to the, the state labs for testing, but because of the intricacies and the dif differentiation among states uh, with vis-a-vis <clears throat> -vis practice, vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, billing and, um, you know, what is covered and not, something like this could actually benefit not just the consult service per se, which is kind of a narrow narrow perspective here, which we're talking about, but could facilitate the, the whole implementation pathways for genomic medicine in general. Now, how you go about doing it can become highly politicized. You know, advisory committees take right. forever. They're, they're not easy to set up, but we can work uh, to try to help you do that. Terry. Oh, it's, a, right. it's a way of thinking at least. Thank you. No, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, maybe uh, in, any last comments on the the, uh, the issues related to um, uh, liability and licensing? Adam? Just really quickly that uh, if we're not practicing medicine and we're curbside consulting, as it were, then that may have relieved some of the licensure concerns. Point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just say uh, we did, we, you know, we have this sort of system going in our institution. Uh, we're trying that at, at Vanderbilt institution level. And I think we were told by our legal department that yes, if you give advice, if you give an opinion to another provider, uh, you don't have that you don't have that high a bar about liability. I think it's the liability becomes the issue if you're directly giving advice to a patient. Right. 
Okay, no, that's that's good to know. So just in our in our last um, little while, uh, sustainability is is always an issue with uh, genetic and genomic services. Uh, I, I saw in in some of the materials that some of you bill um, uh, your practice basically for providing these. Do you have some some thoughts? And I guess we're up to um, Leland. Uh, some thoughts on on how one would sustain something like this. Well, actually, when we were talking about measurement before <laughs> we didn't um, too much, I, one thing I was thinking about was um, measuring the downstream burden on the referring clinicians to any kind of central um, uh, service. You know, with any kind of e-consult, there's um, downstream work, orders, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and so considering that, um, as part of the evaluation, I think would be important. Okay, great, thank you. Um, now, can can I pin you down a little bit on sustainability? Um, I think that that directly impacts sustainability <laughs> um, because if you lead to a bunch of work that is, and I think that that's also where, um, as Dan mentioned, the qualitative data um, and really getting probably rich qualitative data in terms of kind of what is happening, not only for the patients, but also the um, referring clinicians um, and or genetic counselors in like a navigator program and how um, would be invaluable. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Howard. Yeah, I think the we've once we quantitated how many uh, surgeon slots were opened up and how many drugs were now able to be prescribed uh, in oncology, uh, the things changed a lot because you now um, are basically, it's, it's it, genetics becomes a physician extender or a surgeon extender, um, which doesn't sound as glamorous as a geneticist, but is where, as far as the dollars go, um, you know, uh, a surgeon in the OR or a surgeon seeing a new patient has higher value than a surgeon seeing a, a return patient or something that is less uh, well reimbursed. So that's been uh, a lot of the, the dirty secret part is it's um, it's putting, it's going top of license to different folks. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there, if you quantitate that, um, you can pay for the program. Wow, great, thank you. Um, Melinda and Carolyn have their hands up, so Melinda. Yeah, I, um, I think that it's important because the historically, a lot of these services have been uncompensated. And um, and in particularly genetic counseling, um, and I think it's really important that it actually is a billable service, um, and that these dollars are captured for sustainability. Um, I think it's absolutely critical that the genetic counselors become billable providers to be able to support any kind of program such as this growing across the country in any region, and. Um, and so that's the interesting thing. L multiple models have been suggested today, right? From a national level to a state or region um, level consult service. And, and but regardless, um, I think that there needs to be some way to financially sustain that and, and expecting like any GRI or, you know, the, even the government to do that individually or independently is probably not very reasonable for a long period of time. In our clinic, this is essentially what we do. We essentially have a consult clinic and um, and it's been highly successful and completely pays for itself and all of the staff um, because we are actually billing and they are mostly new, like Howard said, they are mostly new patient consults. So we're billing, they're very complicated and time-wise we, we can bill at a very high level. Um, so I think this is a really critical aspect that has to be integrated. It does then tie back into the liability discussion again, because then it's actually patient care and not just necessarily um, providing information to, to other providers, but um, absolutely has to be integrated for sustainability. And, and let me just ask, when, when you do this, um, you, you don't have them all come to you, presumably. You, you can do some of these virtually, or how does that work? We actually are almost 90% virtual. Um, really? Wow. For, and you bill for, for that. For our visits. Mm -hmm. Super. And, and you bill for that. Super. Uh, Carolyn, you had your hand up and you took it down. Um, no, I just took it down so it wasn't annoying because you had already recognized it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my, my issue about sustainability is kind of a funny one is it, you have to make sure that it's not too big of a hassle for the people actually providing the service. And so when we talk about our target audience, 
part of what we have to include is the actual consultants in that target audience. It has to be something that is rewarding, you know, challenging but rewarding, and it can't just be painful um, red tape every time. Um, so it, it has to be vetted enough to where it's a experience that your actual providers want to continue to provide as a sustainable service. I've had problem in multidisciplinary um, uh, conferences and, and patient care where you're just constantly losing the providers because it's too long a block of their time and too big a pain in the butt. Oh, that's, those are excellent points. Thanks. And before I call on Nat, um, I, I might ask uh, Todd, you had made put a comment in the chat about uh, hopefully eventually the provider, providers get to learn that they know enough about this so they don't need the consult. Do you want to comment on, on your experience in that? Um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we've, uh, like in some of the pharmacogenic stuff here, eventually once the providers start using it and they don't, they no longer need to consult us uh, anymore. And so then it's just self-sustaining. They just do it as part of their practice now. I think that would be part of the goal. That said, then I think the console service, there's always going to be new things coming down uh, the road, right? So then it could move from stuff that maybe today needs a consult, you know, a couple of years from now, maybe that now everybody knows how to do that and they move on to some new uh, other things. So that's sort of the idea. So the sustainability part becomes essentially an education. Mm -hmm. Super. No, that's an excellent point. It's great to hear that that's happening too. Uh, and Dan, you put in a comment about a model where this is so valued to genetic uh, companies that they contribute to sustainability. Um, that's a, a great question. It's this. Yeah, well, it's a question. I mean, obviously, this could lead to a lot more utilization of genetic testing over time, which mm -hmm. of, of course would benefit these companies. They 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 employ a lot of genetic counselors. I just I don't know, but mm -hmm. I, I'm just putting it posing it as a question. <laughs> uh, so, Rizwan, did you have point, um, thoughts on that specific question? Yeah, it's just the overall, I think sustainability is such an important question and mm -hmm. we struggle with it. And I think the licensing part where you're giving to make this service sustainable, you, uh, I think getting uh, getting uh, reimbursement is important. Mm -hmm. That then will cut down on equity. Sure. Uh, and I think that'll bring up the issue of licensing. I, I think somebody mentioned that. So I think mm -hmm. sustainability probably requires a much bigger discussion uh, once- yeah. Then we can everything is settled. <laughs> okay, no, thank you. Um, so last comments in three minutes, um, Nat and then Moeen. Thanks. Um, so one thing to remember, when we talk about billing for these <clears throat> e-consults, we're getting $15 maybe. Um, the key to me is institutional support. And one of the big hurdles we've had with institutional support <clears throat> is we cannot genetic counselors are not in independent providers they're they're not recognized as such because they can't bill independently so i think a lot of this comes down to the nash the national effort to get genetic counselors able to bill independently they have licensure and i think once that happens i think that'll set all the cascade of things where counselors can bill they'll get back you know a few dollars uh, a few cents on the dollar for their time but really that's all the hospitals want to see and then, gen then having the data, which exists to show that these kind of services help at the institutional level. And I, I think that's a cascade that will prove very successful. But again, I'm, I'm focusing more on um, th this effort at the local level, not the mm -hmm. national level. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. No, that's fair, fair enough. Um, and then last comment in, in a minute and a half, uh, Moeen. Okay. So sustainability really depends on the ability of the initial the initial setup to show impact in mm -hmm. terms of <clears throat> whether or not uh, the right diagnosis or the right prevention or the right treatment or the uh, better health outcomes can be measured. So this could be highly influenced the, the way you set it up, which services you would focus on. Mm -hmm. And I would, of course, uh, favor the idea of focusing on those services that what I call tier one, meaning that there are accepted evidences of clinical validity and utility mm -hmm. so that, uh, you know, at least in that domain, you can begin to make an impact if you focus the initial offering that way. Great. Oh, those are, that's a great point. Thank you. Um, so Renee, I think we've just barely made it. Um, and so at, at this point, I think I'll turn this uh, over to you for the next uh, topic. Okay, perfect. Um, 
Now, I know that Adam is going to be leaving soon, so I did want to introduce a new panelist who is going to take over for him when he leaves. Um, William, can you promote uh, Cassidy to a panelist? So while he's doing second. that, did someone? No. Okay. So anyway, so we're going to be having a new panelist. Her name is Cassidy. Um, before we move on, though, it looks like we have one hand raised. Moon, did you have a question before we move on? Or is that just an old hand? Okay, old Sorry, hand. That, that was an old hand. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Um, Cassidy, could you just take one second to introduce yourself to the group? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Cassidy Kaleda. I'm a genetic counselor at Geisinger. Um, I work directly with Adam Buchanan, and one of my roles at Geisinger is as co-chair of the Genetic Counseling Professional Council. This is a chartered group internal to Geisinger that is um, directly responsible for the recruitment, retention, education, and professional development of our genetic counselors and genetic counseling assistants. Okay, thank you so much. So our next um, section is, you know, assuming that we have a working consult service, the other um, topic that we were asked to address through the um, meeting was coming up with a, a way to curate advice for recur recurring questions. So like, you know, we get the same question about BRCA1 a lot, you know, is there a way to document that so that people can go and look for those answers? You know, examples of models are the Clingen survey or Clingen or the NCCN guidelines or CPEC. Um, so let's start with, um, you know, are there any of those types of models that you guys think would be useful? And I will start with Jason. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I can't I can't name any off the top of my head, but the immediate analogy that came to mind was, um, you know, nurse triage lines. So this is outside genetics, but, you know, things that are that are very common and can be protocolized in essentially a phone script. Um, someone on the phone uh, who and maybe this is a genetic counselor or even a genetic counselor assistant um, or someone someone, you know, who who can be trained in a very in a in a phone script to really help help get maybe 90% of the work done. Um, I, I would defer to genetic counselor colleagues for what, what, whether such kind of rubrics exist and how to, how to get things, um, you know, is there a BRCA1, you know, phone script? Um, there seems like there should be. Okay, next let's go to Adam. So the maintenance of content is a big issue here. You know, you can think about a learning activity at chat GPT that keeps up with those BRCA associated answers or something like that. But that's uh, that's always the big challenge here for anybody that's trying to build clinical decision support like this. Somebody has to keep the information up to date and also has to put it in a place where clinicians are accustomed to looking for it. You know, we we have built things in the past that have that nobody's paid attention to because we didn't put them in a way that uh, uh, they can be easily accessed and what didn't fit into the flow of care. So, you know, up to date, for example, uh, is accessible through the electronic health record. Uh, physicians go there when they have a question. So we should think about looking to tie into existing places that are normally part of a physician's workflow and that don't require them to go lots of different places. Nate, did you have anything to add? Um, I'm not sure, really. Uh, I, I know there are standard resources out there, but I, I mean, no, I'm, I'm going to just pass on this. One. <laughs> That's fine. OK, let's go down to Leland. Well, I think that this comes down to, you know, also maybe it's a knowledge gap, but also we're talking about personalized medicine, right? And so people want to feel like, even if they may think they know the answer to a question, is that answer appropriate then for that patient, right? And so sometimes this may not be about a gap in knowledge, but more about reassurance for that person. And so I think thinking about addressing, um, even if that's just a pat on the back saying, you're right. Um, so <laughs> I think that, you know, simplified methods of, you know, saying you're right, good for you, um, whether that's a phone triage or a message, like good, 
Um, or I think also just we've talked about training, and I think there's been a talk about training like the next generation in genomic medicine. But I think really in general for our training, we know that across medicine, we need to shift towards being a consumer of up-to-date information as opposed and using that information effectively, as opposed to potentially memorizing um, information that's going to change. And genomics is no different from the rest of medicine. So I'd encourage thinking about it that way. Melinda? Yeah, um, I, I think um, that is a really great point. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge with any um, curated data, database at this point, right, is just that knowledge is constantly evolving, um, you know, literally daily in this space. Um, but I also agree that it really needs to, we really need to think about leveraging resources that exist already, like up to date, right, and utilizing the current workflow of practitioners. Um, and even clinical decision support embedded right directly in the electronic health record itself. So really at point of care, clinicians can access what they need in that second and then be able to access larger information or trigger a consult um, later after that clinical interaction. So I think this is, this is a really big challenge. Um, I like the resources that folks have already suggested. Um, but I also think we don't want to keep building new resources. We should leverage things that are in existence. Carolyn. Hey, that final point is exactly what I was going to say is I've been on the NCCN panel for the last five years, and I know how hard we work to keep that up to date. And I know that the minute it's published, it's already out of date. Um, and I know that last year we added a recommendation for an annual follow-up clinic. So I'm on the HBOC genetics and genomics panel and because examples like PALB2, everything changed. Yesterday, we gave you good advice, but it was wrong. Today, we need to tell you to consider removing your tubes and ovaries. So I would strongly encourage um, leveraging resources that are there being a great source that has links to places that are very carefully maintained and strongly discourage trying to recreate that. It's a, it's a, big effort that's out of date the minute you're done. Cassidy, do you have anything to add? Yes, yeah, so beyond just thinking about these models for, for providers, I also think it's important to build in that education and communication piece as well. So, you know, thinking about success of providing presentations back to uh, a group of providers and taking those NCCN guidelines, for example, and applying them to some case presentations to help make it, all of the information tangible would be an additional resource that we could build in. Okay, Howard. One of my favorite things that's been uh, said so far was by Leland, and that was around the idea that someone has your back. Um, what we've found is that we create a consult service. It's rarely used, but it's one of the most popular things we do. And that doesn't make sense, except the idea that someone is available to have your back allows you to make decisions that you're wondering about. And you, you think you know, but now you can go forward. And you know, if nothing else, if we could do that nationally, if we could, if anybody who wants to do something and thinks they know the right thing, knows that somebody has their back, that would push things forward faster than a fancy database. Uh, and, and so um, I just, I love that she said that, so I want to say it in a, a different way another time. Okay, Todd. For some of the scenarios where it's, uh, you know, the, the repeat questions that, that you're mentioning, it might be uh, you know, related to the, somebody mentioned the, having a case report, if, you know, if you could, have some way to say, okay, we've got this test, uh, whatever, like a Lynch syndrome uh, test or BRCA1 or a fibrogenic test, whatever, and then have a variety of things that might influence the path that that goes. So the provider could then say, okay, yeah, they're over 65. Uh, they're on these, you know, they're on a medication that's X, Y, or Z. And then that would sort of give them the workflow and, and answer the question. So they could, you know, put in some of that sort of stuff might be a way. I, uh, I mean, we do similar things like that for some of the med schools, uh, case studies that, that we do. I don't know if it would work, but that's sort of a, a blue sky and that uh, idea. 
Thank you. Um, Matt. Yeah, so, okay. As I've listened to other people, I've, uh, I've kind of had two thoughts. One is something that Howard mentioned. I don't mean this in any way, and I think Leland mentioned it too, uh, disrespectfully, but one of the things that terrifies me in my experience are the people who think they know what they're doing and they're wrong. So, you know, ha having the resource there and not using it because like, okay, I got this resource, but now I'm gonna move forward. I've seen way more times people will then make the wrong decision than make the right one. So I'm, I'm just making that point that just because they, they feel, people feel confident. I mean, I've been, perhaps the worst decisions I've made are the ones I was the most confident in. Um, but then a the thought is to have, a, a, you know, like our counselors and, and physicians, we all have hundreds of saved notes for different indications, you know, I have a Williams syndrome note, you know, we, we have a BRCA1, BRCA2 note, whatever. So one idea might be to have 10, 25, I don't know how many places around the country where you assign them, like, like Gene Reviews does. You're, you guys are in charge of um, keeping up to date the information on PALB2 or uh, HHT testing or, or whatever. And you know they're in charge with gene reviews. You do it every couple of years, but maybe they do it every couple of months, and so that when it all goes into a shared database, then people can access it. Just a thought. Thank you. And then uh, Muen. So <clears throat> there is obviously no right or wrong answer here. Just a <clears throat> plethora of approaches. So there, there is no substitute to um, humans. Uh, reviewing the literature, reviewing data, and putting it together in the form of, um, you know, evidence, questions, answered. Although you can try to um, teach machines to do some of that. And uh, recently we've had some experience with chat GPT. I tell you, they, uh, I'm, uh, I may be out of business soon because uh, uh, most of what, <clears throat> we did a little bit of an experiment within our office. We ask questions and uh, ask somebody to write the answer. And then we asked GPT to do the same. And there was high concordance. I know I heard yesterday that the Bing uh, artificial intelligence uh, is not doing that well, uh, but at least chat, chat GPT, it's not a joke. I think given how uh, quickly the, the field is moving, trying to have that uh, uh, organization of the knowledge and updating it on a, a routine basis so that it can become available in a personalized way in different parts of the country, going back to the state by state disparities, rural, urban, is so important because the context for influencing and success of this initiative will de depend on the local context much more than on national body like <clears throat> NCCN or the US Preventive Services Task Force, which has <clears throat> done recommendations around BRCA. So I, I think you know part of the research experiment here is to try it different ways and see which one, uh, what is the best approach moving forward, but it could be a combination of things. Thank you. Rizwan, I'm not sure if I'm- Yeah, no, that's name. fine. <laughs> so, so I think our second, I think all, most of us, most most people have already raised all the important points. I think part of the thing to remember here, in my mind, is to to decide bef ahead of time what the scope here would be. You know, what what is going to be the scope of this sort of service and what is going to be out of scope. So that is that is going to be very important. The other thing is, I think for many of the for for some common stuff, yes, educational materials can be developed, information. Uh, Then for what the what our providers fear the most is a genomic report. In that case, it's important to have visual variants, but I think again, the device is find more clarity whether that's more additional clinical work. Uh, or testing, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's doable, but I think important 
point to remember here would be we need to eventually figure out what the scope of this service would be. Thank you. Dan? Well, I put a comment in the chat. I'm no AI expert, but um, it's already been raised. The, the, I, it does seem like recurrent questions, including continuous pooling of updated information from various sources as has been discussed, would be, a, would be a, an optimal application of AI. But um, I, I think that's nothing too original. <laughs> And I think last is Todd. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have any additional stuff to add to it. Okay. Before we move on to the next question, any other additional comments on this one? Okay. So then our next question in the section was that um, we were really trying to look for limitations in the existing sources and possible solutions. We've kind of gone over some of them, but are there any specific limitations that you would like to point out and give possible solutions to? Um, let's start with Jason. I, mean, I think the biggest limitation is that last mile, like, okay, great, I've read the guideline, I need to order this test. Where is that in my EMR? How do I order that test? Who do I call? Um, and you know, and that's not a national question or a medicine question. That's a logistics in my in my practice setting. So that's a limitation. Um, so what's the solution? I don't know. That could be a research question. Um, uh, other limitations are I, I don't know that I have, would have specific examples, but where a patient doesn't exactly fit the specific cookie cutter template. Um, and ha having a system set up that can identify that outlier and that, 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 that being an outlier is important and actually might change the recommendation. Um, also, of course, kind of relates to that, contextualization of the patient's context is really important. Um, you know, the presence or absence of living first degree family members might make a difference. I guess that could be incorporated. Um, other just stuff that's going on in that patient's life um, could make a difference on whether this is actually a question that you really need to address in the big scheme of things. Um, and th that kind of, those aren't in guidelines. So it's, you know, it's, the limitation is it's not a clinician practicing medicine. Perfect. Leland? Oh, looks like you have something in the chat, but. I, I was making a comment to the last point, so I'll just leave it that I have in the chat. Okay, perfect. Um, Melinda? So I think um, I also put a comment in the chat earlier that might be responding to this, but I think there's a real gap in algorithms um, for how to practice genomics in, in, that, in the primary care space and really thinking about integrated algorithms into the electronic health record with clinical decision support and branch chain logic because these the, we have the capacity to build these now. And, um, and I think that ultimately is going to provide a lot of confidence um, in the decision making by each individual clinician, and allow them to not only make the correct decision, but to learn from from this process so that so that over time, they do become experts at each small section of this practice. Carolyn? I was still mulling over Leland's comment. It's such a beautiful comment. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? So we were trying to look for limitations in, in the current existing curation systems. What are the limitations do you see that might apply to what we're doing and how could we fix those? It, yeah, and so that's where I got stuck in her comment about the making this something that the people providing the care um, are going to continue to do, are going to find not lonely and um, sustainable. Okay, thank you. Cassidy, any comments? Yeah, so I agree that this is is two part in some respects. It's not only that technological aspect of it, but to me, it's also thinking about pulling that tech space into um, 
the, who the ordering provider is. So does this sit on, do these next steps for NCCN, for example, sit on the PCP? What about bringing specialty care into it? And then sure, let's say a PCP orders those next steps, but is PCP owning follow up from that as well. So that seems to be a, a larger limitation. We have guidelines, that's great. Someone can follow them, but who should be the follower? Perfect. Howard? Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking through models that might attack some of this. Uh, I, I think we, we need to do something different. The The model we have is not scalable and not answering the problems that, that are really the real problems. They're answering a, the ones we have at the academic centers, not at the community. I'm, I'm almost wondering whether an uber black like model is going to be needed to, to try to um, deliver the uh, white glove service um, in places that have um, mainly pickup trucks. Um, so that's, um, I'm not sure I have an answer for that, but that that's kind of, as I'm distilling down what people are saying, thinking we gotta, we have to have something that is more agile than our usual approach. And right now, uh, usual approaches are great for us, not so great for them, whoever them is. Perfect. Um, Muin. I'm um, <clears throat> trying to mull over this question uh, very seriously, and uh, I think uh, Leland put it very elegantly in, in the chat. In the in the chat, uh, one of the main limitations of existing resources like guidelines is that a they're slow to come around, and b they're not updated on a frequent basis. So you're always chasing uh, the last guideline and specifically in BRCA, I mean, uh, this is a specific example here. I mean, the, the task force did something in 2007 and then 17. So anyway, the bottom line is uh, that, uh, it, it, you know, the system doesn't work very well for a rapidly moving specialty like genomic medicine, and it needs to be supplemented with sort of interim pieces of information, and yes, artificial intelligence to put it all together. And again, we, we can experiment with the best way to do this, but resources can be put in, into it. I think NHGRI has done a great job with the <clears throat> efforts like ClinGen and, and, and things like that, where um, a similar targeted effort can lead to um, immediate dividends uh, if it's evaluated with the <clears throat> good research uh, protocols. Okay. Nate or Nat, sorry. I was, I'm, I'm on mute again. Um, can you can you rephrase the question or or because I'm having trouble with really under, really kind of wrapping my head around it. Right. So what we're talking about now is you know if we have a consult service rather than having people consult continually on the same questions. Is there a way that we could create an expert panel or somehow curate that advice so that, you know, if you answer it for patient X, it'll be available so that patient, you know, the provider for Y and Z can just see it and maybe not have to go through the consult service again? Yeah, so, you know, it's like when you go to uh, an online, you know, shopping site and, you know, they're frequently asked questions. And I'm sure you know, especially the younger generation will is more, more likely to be able to search that and get information from it than, you know, somebody my age who, you know, just wants to talk to somebody. Um, so, you know, creating that kind of database um, where if it's something's been asked and answered properly, they can just click on it um, makes a lot of sense. But the thing I keep getting back to is, is buy-in from other people, buy-in from the community and that, and that's not really what you're asking about, but I'm I'm just struggling again. Like, I'm imagining this, the difficulty we've had at our own, you know, academic institution. UAB is a pretty reasonable academic institution, not to mention the community. And, and I'm just trying to imagine this thing on scale. The, the 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 and I think somebody said this comment really earlier. I think the most important thing we should be looking at is a PR a PR firm had a you know if we're going to try something like this there has to be some kind of way to publicize it and show the benefit to people but that's that's kind of an aside thank you Dan 
Yeah, um, I don't know if this is directly answering the question you just posed the way you phrased it, but I've been thinking about this service in terms of providing the, the upfront you know, advice around genetic testing. So for the primary care physician, should this patient be tested? What panel should I use? What company might, might run that panel? At the end of the day, it seems like one of the big blocks is what's my patient, you know, what's my patient going to have to pay out of pocket? Are they going to be hit with a bill? The kinds of things that those of us have counselors, we, we the counselors help us figure that out, or the GCAs. But how do we, how does this service help the physician in the community, you know, get to the point where they 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 feel comfortable ordering a, a, a panel without uh, placing a big bill on the patient? Um, and um, I think it seems to me, from my perspective, that's a big block that I'm not sure I know how to overcome. <laughs> so are just are you saying that something, you know, we, we put together genetic advice all the time. Is it would it be helpful to put together advice surrounding the the non-tangibles like payment and what stuff? You know, here's a list of all the providers and the labs. And you know, if you're with this insurance, then these are the ones to pick, that kind of thing. Definitely. That's exactly what I'm saying. Something very, very specific around this patient has this insurance or is on Medicaid and here's the company that you should use for this panel and here's what they're going to get charged out of pocket. And yeah, exactly. I don't know if others agree, but that's my perspective. So clinical support tools for ordering in ways. Okay. Leland? I, I think that's an interesting comment. I think, um, you know, given the diversity of our healthcare system though, like I would almost envision the opposite, which would be an office hours with a genetic counselor and genetic counseling assistant who comes in and over lunch is like, okay, I had like these patients over the past, you know, that are kind of bothering me on my panel or runs a report of their patients and says, hey, all of these people qualify for bracket testing. Let's do it together and let's place it together. Um, and, you know, this is how you're going to get it back. And this is the support you're going to have. And we'll come back in six weeks and help you with that. Um, as because I the the logistical barriers without these labs being integrated and the portals and the <laughs> I think are just too high for anything <laughs> unless they're integrated in that healthcare system. Carolyn, I, I have two comments. I think the reason I'm struggling with the answer to this is I think my answer is no. So. Um, I think that if the goal was to have the service be some written up to date thing, it could not not be personalized, could not not be personalized. There you go. So it it would be if that's the intent, then I would say it's more of an e-consult service so that the person providing the response to the specific case could be templated because we can keep up our templates. Um, but it couldn't be something that a provider would just say, tell me today about this or about that. So I, I think um, that's why I've struggled a little bit with how to answer that question, because I think the answer is no, if you're talking about, could you just have an online resource that would be no longer individualized and and have the, the big lift of keeping it up to date. Um, but the second comment I wanted to make um, a couple of people have touched on reimbursement and insurance. And in my new job, the first and most shocking thing to me was that I have none of that. One, once you meet the criteria, the patient's covered. And so if you knew that was the answer, would you give the same answer to what our testing criteria? And so I wonder in setting this up as a national program, if that shouldn't be exactly how we think of it. Because if we give answers based on, well, it depends on where you live, and well, it depends on your insurance. Maybe we're not giving the the big national answer, and and maybe the point to this is the pretend that insurance didn't matter, which is kind of my life at the VA now. What would you say to this situation, to this scenario? But it would remain personalized and not generic. Thank you, Todd. Yeah, so I I think to um, you know address the reimbursement thing, which I think is a you know, to address the limitations bullet point uh, one, as was mentioned, one of the things that I recently discovered that uh, IU Health has is a phone number that any patient can call uh, that phone number and get an estimate 
of what the test is going to cost. They will, based on your insurance, your amount of deductible you've already met and everything. So it's going to be the out-of-pocket cost. My understanding from talking to our revenue cycle is that was required as part of the Affordable Care Act, but I might be not quite, I might not have that exactly right, but I think there may be some of these resources that uh, a lot of healthcare institutions may have that a lot of people don't realize is, is there. I mean, having struggled with reimbursement for uh, quite a while, I only found out about this about two, three years or two, three months ago when we found the right person or revenue cycle to talk to. So that might be something somehow that we uh, tap into those resources to actually uh, address that. The other limitation is quickly that's not in the guidelines is you know, the liability risk and who's responsible if your name is on the test. So it's another limitation, that's it. Is there anyone else who would like to make a comment on this type of curation service that we haven't covered? There's one. Yeah, so I was going to say, so I think if you think about it, I think the you can say yes, the answer is yes, you could do this. It's an informatics uh, question, a problem. And uh, but that does then add some barriers, meaning the informatically one way to think about doing this would be that this, the, the question is not asked by a phone, but by a web portal. The physician says, OK, I have this patient. Uh, he provides whatever question, uh, whatever test results that they want explanation for. And then that particular website keeps track of that specific question and the answer that was given so that the next time the question is asked, even before the physician presses send, he will, he or she will get the answer like, okay, somebody anonymously, you know, asked this question about the same gene variant and this was the answer given and see if that, so I think that can be done, but the barrier there is, it's a lot easier to pick up the phone and if it is a phone-based service to ask that question, as opposed to using Qualtrics or RedCap or some other sort of database. I mean, there's some attractiveness to using a database-based model or a web portal to, for this sort of service, because then you can actually collect information and you know, you know what I'm saying? It's, 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 you can do a lot with that data and further fine tune it figure out what questions people are asking, further fine tune the answers. Anyway, I think those are the comments. Thank you. Anyone else want to chime in on this topic? Okay. So, is that an old hand for Nat? I think it's an old hand. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what it's doing there. So, okay. okay. In that case, I think it's a good time to move on to the next session that um, Terry will moderate. Sure. All right. Thanks, everyone. We, we've been going a, a good hour and 22 minutes. Um, so thank you all for your attention. We just have a little bit longer to go. Um, and now we're going to talk about outcomes. Um, so we had, had kind of identified you know, sort of three areas that outcomes might, or people, groups that, that outcomes might be important to, starting with experts uh, and the clinicians receiving them and, and outcomes important to patients. Um, so I'm going to go back to the, the alphabetical approach because that's the only way I can keep track of everyone. Um, and Cassidy, could I ask you, um, the, the people who are providing consults, what, what kinds of things do you, what kinds of outcomes do you think they would like to have measured and would be important to them? That's a good question. So for those who are providing these consults, I would think that important metrics would be, I mean, I think satisfaction is an easy answer here, satisfaction of those. So you're talking about the experts who are providing the consults, not the clinicians right. coming. Correct. What's, what's going to keep them doing this? I would think satisfaction feedback from the clinicians who are coming for this, this consult service. Um, but I think that's a, an easy gimme. And maybe this is an obvious one. I, I don't know, but uh, we thought it was important to try to address a variety of outcomes. So, and I, I realize I, I, I may have thrown you a bit because it's you're not really alphabetical, but you're Adam Buchanan, so you are. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, Rizwan, do you have some thoughts on on what outcomes might be important to, and let's not just say the experts, but the people providing the the um, the consults, whoever they may be. You're on mute. First one, you're on mute. Thanks. Uh, satisfaction would be one. The other one would be whether this is uh, actually making an impact. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. I think finding out that, okay, the advice you are giving actually. So I think that actually feeds into what is important for the, for the, uh, for the person who's getting the advice. Are they making an impact mm -hmm. in, in either cost reduction, patient outcome, patient satisfaction? Uh, so I think those are probably the, uh, you know, are the main things that are going to drive it because as a, as a clinical provider, you like to know that you are, or, or as a, or the genomicist, you would like to know that what advice you're giving is making an impact. Mm -hmm. okay. Great, and, and maybe I'll ask both of you, challenge you and and, and Cassidy. When you say satisfaction, um, you know uh, there are songs about that, but but <laughs> what do you mean by by satisfaction? I think about it uh, with with this particular question, the satisfaction from clinicians who are. Um, approaching this consult service, that they continue to come back for further input. And so they're satisfied with the information they've received previously, so that they're coming back for additional input as, mm -hmm. as they need. Mm -hmm. okay. I think, yeah, I think satisfaction means that the physician on the other end uh, found that useful, that information. Mm -hmm. And they've thought like, okay, I'm getting some thoughtful feedback back, as opposed to, oh, this is just a sort of templated thing that I got and I don't find it very useful. So I think, you know, we have we have been doing this for now a year and a half here at Vanderbilt. And we found out that is a very important thing and we have to go back and forth, get the feedback. Okay, what do you find useful? What do you don't find useful? Mm -hmm. Is this advice helpful with this advice? And we have continued to tweak, we call it the genetic, you know, we have two names for this, but we have to tweak, we had, we've been tweaking it all along every month, figuring out what, our customer wants from us. Mm -hmm. And that is very important because if, the, if, you, if you're not providing what they want from us, they stop using us. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that makes, that makes perfect sense. But do we wanna think about outcomes for the people who are doing this in terms of, of how easy is it? You know, how much time does it take them to, to do it? Are they answering the same boring question over and over again? I mean, I don't know, but, but what, what do you think? Dan, you, you look like you might have something you wanna comment. No, that's interesting, Terry. I was thinking about that, like the the job, the, essentially the the job satisfaction for the people right. who are doing this, and what determines that. And um, I do think, in addition to feeling like they're actually helping clinicians and ultimately patients, just what what is the nature of the day to day job? What's the variety of the um, you know questions they get asked? How much of the routine stuff can be automated so that they can focus on the more personalized, you know, interesting individual questions? I'm not sure how to how to quantitate all that, but I think those are very important to try to capture in some way. <clears throat> Great. No, thank you very much, uh, Leland. You want to uh, take one one last crack at uh, at the people who are providing the consults, other things, or outcomes? You're, you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry, I thought I'd unmute it. Um, so I think uh, focusing on just ways to measure kind of top of license care, I think the other thing that you could think about is some kind of, um, since we've been talking about kind of the community, um, knowledge and comfort with genetic testing in general. Um, and then I think you could think about maybe kind of some kind of social network, both at the patient and provider level, um, in terms of kind of how does, is there any spread of information or misinformation um, <laughs> as a result of um, accessing these services amongst providers and amongst patients and communities. Great, and, and I'm gonna try to pin you down a little bit on top of care. Do you, do you mean um, providing care that is you know, at, the, at the highest level of their expertise? Can you explain what that is? Right, so I think of top of license care as kind of minimizing um, documentation and or um, you know, administrative burden, um, while also, um, yes, it, kind of doing what for whatever clinician role that is. And I think that that would vary amongst clinicians, um, including the genetic counselors um, and uh, advanced practice providers, um, what they, uh, I'm not quite sure what the metrics are there, but would have to look into it. <laughs> okay, no, fair enough. And we have two comments, Nat, go ahead. Um, uh, people have given some really good comments. I'm, I'm kind of going to go in a different, slightly different direction is when, when I talk to people who get these calls and myself included, they're, when, when they're not reimbursed or recognized or included in your time, they are a huge pain in the butt. So one of the things in terms of satisfaction of the consultants, 
will be making sure it's accounted for in their effort, and especially through genetic counselors who, you know, uh, when it comes out of your hide and you're in your quote unquote free time, it, it's, it's viewed very negatively, where I think if it was included as a set aside amount of time, it would be viewed much more positively. Great. No, excellent point. Thank you, Nat. Uh, Carolyn? My comment's extremely basic. It's that I think the biggest physician dissatisfier I've ever seen is when there's a mismatch between what we consider successful. So it, a good example is if we set something like timeliness as one of the, the things that we're tracking and following, the physician or the provider may know that the patient delayed this appointment. The patient was offered an earlier appointment, but at the end of the day, what was reported out was it was a month to see that patient, you know. So mm -hmm. just having having it clear to the providers that we're all agreeing on what success looks like. Kind of basic, but but important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's super. Okay. Uh Wayne, do you want to take one last last crack at uh at experts, even though I gave Leland the last crack, but I'll give no, you I, I think the uh the way the way you've um uh, kind of uh, parsed out the uh, the four different buckets for outcomes important to experts, clinicians, patients, and research questions is kind of a, you get immediately into the weeds before you, you're you trying to evaluate the impact of the, the whole thing because, you, you know, you're embarking on something new and therefore the, you're going to experiment with ways to um, evaluate its impact from all of these perspectives. So to me, the the experts providing the consults, uh, there the outcomes could be whether or not there is any different outcomes if they're paid for their service versus not paid. I mean, that's a research question uh, or they're doing it in their spare time, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon versus, you know, as part of their regular workflow. But to me, just designing that the series of outcomes that um, uh, sort of a la implementation science perspective where you, you, you look at the different levels and, <clears throat> and you approach it from a uh, comparing different approaches and see which which works the most. Obviously for the patient, uh, the person providing the service, he or she would love to see their services taken up <clears throat> and making an impact to the patient. But from the, the whole service perspective, the ultimate outcome is a societal one. Do we need that service? I mean, has, has this service uh, saved lives or made better diagnosis or led to better treatment than without a service. So to me, a, ho a holistic approach to the uh, <clears throat> the impact is, you know, much better than focusing on only the components. So mm -hmm. maybe you were going to get there, but uh, just couldn't help but oh, no, appreciate it. The outset. Well, and I wonder, I mean, if, if you might want to comment, the CDC, a different part of it, I believe, um, uh, does provide consultation on infectious diseases, for example. Um, so, so you know, with, with um, not Ebola, I think they did it for Ebola as well, but with COVID, you know, there was a hotline that you could call or contact and, and that. And so, so what were the, the metrics that assessed that? Or was it just something that, hey, this is the CDC, we have to do this? And right. Well, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, CDC during the pandemic, kind of uh, all hands were on deck. <clears throat> and obviously, uh, in a fast moving uh, pandemic situation, the uh, the evaluation metrics tend to be a little bit uh, different than something you do more carefully. Mm -hmm. So in, in this case, um, <clears throat> I think the infectious disease consults may not be the right comparison to uh, something like this. But uh, you have the luxury of designing <clears throat> something at the outset and evaluating it, but I, I can check to see if the uh, whatever CDC did during the pandemic made a difference. But from my perspective, it doesn't matter. CDC gets beaten up <clears throat> no matter what. Either way, I mean, whether or not we did the right thing. Sure, but I think you you do have experience, or that yeah. that part of the CDC has experience with with what measures you know they've tried and have been useless, yeah. or you know whatever. And so so maybe if you could put us in contact with the folks. Yeah. Yeah. Opinion, that would be because I I'm unaware and maybe others of you are aware of, of anything quite like what we're thinking of doing other other than you know this this CDC model. Um, does anyone know of you know as a practicing clinician I can't think of a place that I can just sort of call up and say hey tell me what to do with you know a GI bleed or you know whatever it, it might be. 
So Leland just put in VA. VA. I was going to say the same thing. Potential genomics telemedicine consult. <laughs> and I don't think they ever published their like findings about the regional versus, did they ever publish the results about like what the um, impact of the centralized telemedicine at the VA? So, so I, I, I'll call on Jason, but I might also put Renee on notice since Renee was part of that whole system before she joined us that we'll call on you as well. But Jason, please go ahead. So Martin Schooner has looked at some of this and, and comparing, comparing kind of more traditional genetics consultation from, from nearby services. Um, and it's a mixed bag. You know, she found, you know, of course, you you can get access out to rural veterans through a through a hub and spoke model or through a centralized model. Um, but uh, she also found concerningly some racial and ethnic, ethnic disparities that also resulted um, and that actually having local services seem to ameliorate that. So I think it's been looked at. Uh, it, I, think, I think like anything, it's gonna take a mix of different kinds of interventions and programs to, to really reach everybody. And the result of those is the program that just opened in September, the Clinical Cancer Genetic Service. So the Genomic Medical Service is a general genomics service um, clinical cancer genetics is in response to some of those disparities that were identified in cancer patients specifically. Cool. Great. Uh, Renee, do you want to um, share some of your experience? Well, I think it's important to note that that was a strict referral service. Like there was very little e-consult. We did try to do an expert e-consult for a little while and our expert ghosted us because he just didn't have the time, you know? So I, I think that the, that expert satisfaction is really important, making sure that this is a reimbursed part of their job that they're getting credit for. Otherwise it, it's, it's not high on their priority list. Um, you know, and I also think it's really important that when we're comparing these types of services, we're comparing equally resource services that, you know, I think a lot of the comparisons of the telehealth services to the traditional genetic services is a really great idea. But when you have a national telehealth service with seven counselors going across the nation, can you really compare that to a local service with three genetic counselors going to three hospitals? So I just, I think we really need to keep a perspective when we're doing evaluations. Great point. Super. Um, maybe we can, we've touched a little bit on this, but there may be more uh, thoughts on, on uh, outcomes that are important to, to the clinicians receiving the, the consults. So I've, I think I stopped it, Muin. So Melinda, do you want to comment on, on what might be important to the receivers of this information? Yeah, I think the timeliness of the consult, so the turnaround time for the consult and how quickly they get access to the information will be critical. I think that Clinicians um, requesting the consult will also care about the patient outcomes, right, and the impact on the patient satisfaction, which directly then reflects on, on the satisfaction with their own provider. Um, so I think uh, at, those two things are critical. And then I think the confidence, as, as has been mentioned many times, I think the confidence in the information they're receiving and the ability to take that and implement it um, will be important to them. Great, thank you. Uh, Howard, do you want to add to that? No, I, I, I do think, as much as I hate to say this out loud, I do think that the clinician and patient satisfaction piece is um, really important, not as a metric that we tout about, but if it reflects that they feel, their perception is they were helped. And it's been surprising to me, sometimes I have said, I don't know, and that's been incredibly helpful to people. And there's sometimes when I've had an answer that was too fancy for them and, and they didn't think I was helpful at all. So, um, and everything in between. Um, so I, I think um, that is a really important part. Part if, we're going, if, if our ultimate goal is for genomics to be normal and just part of medicine, um, we have to be going and using those metrics to help guide us. Mm -hmm. Oh, good point. And Melinda did put in the chat, the volume for the service will be massive. I mean, we would hope. Uh, <laughs> I worry that you put something like this together and nobody comes, but um, but it can't be be small or part-time. And, and I would agree uh, as, it, as it grows, we probably do mean, need to make it um, larger and larger depending on the demand. So thanks for that point. 
Um, let's see, Howard. So Carolyn, did you have other things to, that you wanted to comment on the, the uh, clinicians receiving this information? Um, I guess I just have more to say about the VA. So I'll wait until that's more relevant. But, but the big picture is we, we are doing more and more e-consults because that's how you scale. And the other thing that we're doing more and more of because of scalability is point of care. So job one was getting getting education to the providers um, and getting the nitty gritty nuts and bolts of how do I order this test? That, that's the end of the day is what button do I click? Mm -hmm. So getting getting that information out so that this can be scalable because mm -hmm. of the, the volume. And the VA now has a single medical record system? No. <laughs> oh. So how, how, do you Not even what, close. What, how do you tell them what button to push? It, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, there, there are a lot of talks going on right now about this. There are two ways to write the lab order in your local system, and there is one way to write the order for the portal that'll be covered by the National Precision Oncology Program. So, so we've got it all narrowed down to if it's going to be paid by NPOP, here's how you can order it directly on the portal, and here's how you document it. And then I came in a little heavy handed and said, but you're not clicking the order unless you can click several of the informed consent points. Mm -hmm. So you you get to the order through a note and the note has key informed consent parts to it. Oh. And then based on the result, a large percent of them will be seen by e-consult. So the VUSs and the high risk negatives will come in as e-consult. Otherwise we can't possibly scale it nationwide. Mm -hmm. Super, thank you. Uh, Dan, do you have a comment? Yeah, I think with regard to importance to the clinicians, one big issue is time. So is engaging with this service actually taking more time away from them or is it saving them time? Um, and, and again, hard to quantitate, but I think a really important issue at the end of the day, they're going to use it if they perceive that it's going to save them. Not In addition to giving them important information that they don't have, if it's gonna save them time and they're not gonna use it, if it's just gonna to add to their burden of, of time. <clears throat> Excellent point, yep, great. All right, anything else about um, outcomes or feedback from clinicians who are using the service uh, that we wanna be aware of? Yeah, just, just to pick up on Dan, I agree. I agree time is important, but if they're also persuaded that patient care was really improved as a result, they'll take the time. Um, so if, so something, somehow being able to demonstrate to them that actually you delivered more guideline concordant care as a result of the, the information you got, um, the, your change in medical decision making or the actionability of the information you got actually improved things, patient, the patient care or patient health outcomes, then they'll, it'll be, it won't, they won't invest days to make that happen, but they'll invest some extra time if they're persuaded that that really was a result. Mm -hmm. um, a survey, a, a method you could get at that would be you know, asking in their opinion, did they think patient care improved as a result? Mm -hmm. It's pretty, pretty subjective. Um, but short of short of obtaining medical records from the patient, there might not be a lot, many ways to, to assess that outcome. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, and Leland put in the um, in the chat, repeat visits to the service as a proxy for satisfaction. That's an excellent um, um, measure, uh, assuming that they're continuing to see patients who have these things, um, which I, I think we can we can fairly assume for some things, maybe not for, for others. So, uh, in our one, one other thing, uh, Terry, that might think it just back one question about what other services might be a similar thing. The only thing I can think of is maybe the poisoning and toxicology oh. uh, hotline, you know, or, and I'm not a clinician, so I've never called that, so I don't know exactly how it works or whatever, but uh, that might be something that might be the close uh, thing. That's a great idea. Um, I've called the poison hotline many, many times, um, and they are incredibly helpful. Uh, so, and and I do wonder how they are, you know, staffed and paid for. So that's that's an excellent idea. Thank you so much. We'll we'll look into that. I would add too, just to wrap together a few things that were said um, about the clinicians, not only looking at their confidence, but the impact of whether or not they feel more empowered. But then the marketability marketability aspect of this as well are clinicians who utilizing who utilize this service, talking to other clinicians who then pick up on this service as well. And do we have frequent flyers who continue to come back to it because they find a lot of value in it? Mm -hmm. Or they're not learning. I mean, that's, that could be another reason to come back, right? Uh, but hopefully not. So um, cool. 
All right, and then in our last few minutes, maybe um, you know we're, we're encouraged to think about outcomes that are important to patients, recognizing that this may not a service may not be a service that deals directly with patients. Are there things that patients would want to to know that a service is providing? Obviously, better care um, would be would be a pretty clear one. Um, but I'm I'm wondering where did I leave off? Uh, I think with with Nat. Um, so Todd, do you have, have thoughts in terms of um, uh, what kinds of things we'd want for patients? Yeah, um, <clears throat> only just from some of the interviews and stuff we've done with them, return and pharmacogenics results, they just want to know what to do, uh, mm -hmm. right? As much as, uh, uh, you know, as we may think they may be interested in, in genetics, they, um, the majority of them uh, aren't, um, and they just want to know, you know, what do I do and what are my options? Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, you know, I think the obvious uh, things like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And this is the patients, not the clinicians, right? Correct. Yep. It's the, it's the, uh, uh, definitely the patient. So we've done, uh, you know, probably now 50 or 75 interviews of patients that we've re returned pharmacogenetics results to, uh, you know, and it's the, uh, the thing, it's just typically just, I just want to know what to do, uh, right. right? I don't uh, care about all the other things, so. I don't want to learn Mendelian genetics. Just tell me what to do. Great. All right, Melinda, you had a comment? Yeah, I think as part of the equity discussion, um, there are a lot of patients who want to know who is learning this information about them. Good genetics point. is a very private detail and very personal. And, um, and we see that with referrals, right? Um, when we call the referral to schedule them, they're very startled about someone else knowing about this about them. Um, who are we? How do we know it? Why do we have this information? And so I think that's actually going to be important to patients to know something about this service. Great. No, that's a good point. Uh, Carolyn put in the, the final product um, with the family sharing letter. Many patients really want that above even personal steps. Uh, do you want to comment on that, Carolyn? It, just that in what do patients consider a successful visit? Virtually every genetics visit, and again, I do cancer, but virtually every genetics visit, they they won't let you even try to stop until you've talked about implications to their family. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Good, good, good. Great. Um, other things, other thoughts of what might be important to patients? I think downstream healthcare utilization and costs that they face, um, mm -hmm. if they experience those as a result of um, any referrals made. And then I think you could also think about the impact beyond just family members on the general community. You could consider doing some kind of social network analysis or asking about whether um, patients you know, made any changes um, based or shared these results with other community members. Mm -hmm. Great idea, super. All right, Howard. A lot of genomics currently is set up as being a kind of a one-off um, or just a few visits. And um, many patients now, especially on the cancer side, are, are now at risk for multiple cancers. And they have to see a breast surgeon and a gastroenterologist and a urologist if they're male or a gynecologist if they're female. You know, we've set up a, a clinic where we can go one place and be guided by all those expertise. And they can be managed in almost more of a genomics medical home type of, uh, of mindset. And I don't see that very many places and I, that's really missing. The people that fall through the cracks, it's often there is no visit three or visit visit four. Visit one and visit two are nailed. It's the rest of it that falls apart. So some I'm not sure how to fix that, but if we are setting something up, maybe having a mechanism, a referral, a triage, whatever, where they can be managed preferably virtually, um, uh, over the next years, as opposed yeah. to just one-offs. Excellent point. Thanks. Good. Any any other points to be made here? I think I would say I was just going to second what Leland was saying, and I was thinking about it, and this is based on our personal experience too. You know, in clinic, is that did the did the information the patient get lead them down to a rabbit hole? Meaning. Lead, lead, led them to additional testing, more frustration. I think that will have to be captured. Most patients are not like that, but I think a, a segment of patients 
um, uh, we would want to capture, you know, what they thought about uh, it's now suddenly finding out that they have to see 10 more specialists, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, but I think. Yeah. Excellent. All right, uh, Dan. With regard to patient outcomes, uh, I think another would be um, impact on family members. So, so for you know dominant conditions, you know what you know what what was communicated to family. How many other family members were were diagnosed as a result of you having been diagnosed? Um, would be really great to try to collect that information. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Great, yeah, good point. All right, I think we're pretty much at a close to to these kinds of things. So we're at the next steps. Um, do you, Renee, you want me to start with that? Do you want to start with it? You can start. I can start. <laughs> okay, great. Well, we will consider consider all of this. We may come back to a, to a few of you um, with some some thoughts um, and uh, probably will draft something that is more, you know, basically a summary or a, a, not a transcript, but a summary of, of um, uh, what we heard. As you're probably aware, when um, when we we start to think about what initiatives or concepts we, we might move forward with, um, we tend to kind of go into a, a bit of a quiet mode on that. So you may not hear much uh, about this after after um, this, this meeting, but um, we will put uh, this recording, we did record this and you all said that was okay. Um, so we'll put this recording on the website for the Genomic Medicine 14 um, meeting, primarily so that those who weren't able to participate um, get the same information um, that uh, that y'all have and that we have. So Jason, you raised your hand. Yeah, sorry. I was waiting for the bullet point about kind of other outcomes. Oh, so, I'm so sorry. So that, yeah. it, but, but you know, go, going back to our sustainability question, yes. those kind of research questions can be built in from the mm -hmm. beginning. So stakeholder engagement from the ground floor will help identify who's gonna, so if, if we're talking about what NHGRI can do, you know, fund a research project, NHGRI is gonna wanna know who's gonna take this over when the five years is done. Mm -hmm. And those kind of questions and, and the data to inform the answers to those questions should be collected. So that's how much does this cost? How many FTE do we need to hire? Um, who who will take this over and and what will the payment model for that be moving forward all that has to be collected from the beginning and planned right. for thank you for reminding me of of that i'm going to uh, take since we are only at 12:52 eastern um uh, other other research questions uh, that we should be addressing uh, in this model My, how I think one, you know one of the things that that, that can uh, help keep people engaged uh, if they come up with additional research questions as an example. So I sit in on our molecular tumor board and, you know, look at drug-drug interaction stuff. I don't get effort covered for it. But the reason that keeps me coming back is because you're looking for extreme toxicities, extreme responders, additional questions that we've now brought into the research uh, realm. So I think that's, you know, the opportunity for that is something that can actually keep uh, the uh, people who are um, you know, I guess providing the consults uh, engaged. Great, great point. Um, Howard, you have your your hand up. It's probably an old hand, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, what what thoughts you might have on research questions around this? And the first question is, how do I get the hand to drop a little? Bit? <laughs> right. uh, I think the the. Um, the, the thing that's emerging in in genetics and in this area is just the pleiotropic nature of the results. And you know, I, I hinted at it with the the need for a BRCA two patient to be followed up by a bunch of different specialists. The same is going to be true. The same is already true with pharmacogenomics. Same is going to be true with some of the polygenic risk scores because you're if you order one, you're really going to get twenty or however many that company does it because it's the same platform. So, research on how does one handle uh, Lots of information when you just wanted a little <laughs> is kind of um, yeah. going in. And because we're going to, we do now, we get stuff we didn't ask for. You know, you might be looking for something and you find a leaf from me. Well, you're glad you found it, but that's not what you're looking for. You know, um, so I'm not sure what the right question is, but that that's a, an area that needs to be tackled more systematically. Right now, it's just kind of everybody's winging it. Great point. Yep. Super. And I see um, Jason suggesting impact on health equity will also be a critical outcome, I would agree. Um, and I believe we had from Melinda, how does this fit into a larger phased approach to fully integrating genomics into primary care? 
Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a good one. Other research questions? And, and this may be one you want to give a little thought to maybe maybe once you see the the summary in that we're you know where to find us um, we're, we're always available and and uh, interested in in uh, what kinds of, of research gaps there are and how we can contribute to filling them so, so I think with that um, we might be able to give you a few minutes back Renee did you want to uh, make some closing comments no, I mean I just wanted to thank all of you for spending the past two hours with us this has been incredibly helpful and we thank you for your time and your expertise. Great. So thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Thank you all. Bye now. Bye everybody.